whichever one I'm with at that moment. It's like your kids. Yeah. How do you say which is your most favorite? At times, I tend to show interest in different plant families and groups, but there's a motto of, of master gardeners throughout the United States. Master gardener programs, by the way, are programs through the agricultural extension offices that all states have. They're usually county specific, but the master gardener's mantra is the right plant in the right place. So it comes down to where am I in the garden? Yes. Because a garden isn't only one place. A garden, when you learn to interact with it, have what are called microclines, little niche areas where the light, the ventilation, the humidity, the temperature, those things may be subtly different to you, but to a plant it could be tremendously different. So if in certain areas, I know that ferns like to grow. I tend to like the look right now of maidenhair ferns. They come in different sizes and shapes, and yet they're not the common ones that people regard as being weedy ferns per, per se. So ferns I find fascinating. Aeroids are fascinating because they're so varied, tremendous in one plant family to cover things ranging from the anthurians that I like because the leaves tend to be large, leathery, velvety, at least the kind that I like to grow. Mm -hmm. There's birds and that's anthurians, but I'm known more for the velvety leaf type, the larger ones, and I find those to be quite satisfying because once the leaf matures, it's not like other, say, allocases or colocases where the leaf tissue structure is kind of flimsy, it actually gets a leathery feel yeah. to it. And, uh, but those are just examples, ferns, aeroids. I grow orchids, bromeliads I've been real big with, and I think we took a few pictures earlier so you can see what those look like. Uh, then there's a lot of oddballs, things that don't fall into any general big family. And sometimes those are the most fascinating because those are the ones that are not as wide known or as widespread but sometimes the flowers on those are fascinating and they include sometimes succulents. I think we looked at a few different cacti flowers today, which in detail are fascinating to me because when I see those flowers and I realize that they're not pollinated by a bee or a butterfly or even a small little insect, they're very often pollinated by flies. And so as pretty as the flower looks like, the other thing that flowers have is scents very often. Those don't tend to be particularly pleasant for us, but if you smelled like carrion or something rotting, and it might just attract the fly pollinator. One thing is the smell, but the other thing are sometimes the ornate patterns that are in some plants. So we looked at a few cacti flowers earlier today, which is amazing to me because whatever insect looks at that, you realize that through eons, that plant has evolved to find something that magically works for where it comes from that attracts the insect pollinator that it's trying to work with. Remember, the plant is existentially rooted, isn't it? It can't just yeah. jump around and say, here, come to me, bug. It has to find ways, either chemically or through its appearance, to attract pollinators. And that's the way the plant's genetics really work, to ensure its survival, because it has to rely on those insects or animals in some cases to be able to help the plant move from here to someplace else in the world. And they're very successful in that. Plant chemistry also is something that I have a tremendous amount of respect for the power of plants' chemicals and how they influence their environment. I want everybody to know that I refer to Dr. Block as a physician botanist before, but it's so much more than that. He is a thought leader. There's so much science behind what he does here and it's truly amazing it's truly amazing i have so many more questions but i know we don't have time but is there anything you want to leave us with other than those very kind words thank you <laughs> you're welcome part of the the idea and why we agreed to have this exchange to let you see the property is that's the evidence for the method everything that you've seen is is part of things and, and it, it's sort of my job to share it yeah. So that's what we've done today, including with everybody listening. If there's anything I can leave you with for this is we're all students and we start at a certain point and we learn. That's only half of it. If you don't pass along what you've learned to the people that will follow you, either you're not going to be remembered for contributing something to the process. So in fact, I have to consider myself as a custodian. Mm -hmm. I'm only here during my watch. It's not forever. 
yeah, I've done a job sustaining some things that other people may have challenges with, but it's not impossible. We've just seen it today. Part of a fiduciary relationship with nature that we all have, whether you're a physician, botanist, or just somebody playing with plants is try your best, be a good observer. Look, the plant will tell you what it needs to know. And it doesn't need to know its name necessarily. I never met a plant that yeah. cared what I called it, okay? yeah. other than late to dinner. Mm -hmm. So if, if you're a good observer and you, you are there and you nurture the plants along, you fulfill the custodial responsibility that humans should have for their environment and nature. And, and that overall is really the overriding message that I'd like all of your listening audience to take with you. You can do this too. It just takes a little observation initiative, maybe an investment, but it's time. And, and that's what we all have some of using yeah. wisely.